Hi, I'm Natalie Baker, and I'm going to read you the opening of my novel, Silent as a Shade, a contemporary retelling of the Greek myth Orpheus and Eurydice. It's just gone six, and a waxing crescent is ghost-like, barely visible. A lighthouse keeper sees it slip between sheets of light. He turns on the radio transmitter and listens as ships talk to each other. They don't know who's there in the watch room listening in, but he's always there and never a second late waiting for things to happen as everyone else sleeps. Despite it being late September, the air is heavy with a promise of a heat wave, clear skies, calm seas. He can't stomach hot weather. It turns on him making his hands and feet swell. When the sun is at its highest point, he'll close the blinds and wear earplugs to block out unwelcome sounds. Children playing on the beach, the jingle jangle as another ice cream van passes through. He likes the ones that mould to the shape of his ear holes, once he tried blue tack, but the ball got itself lost in his ear canal. Sometimes he can feel it rattling about like a piece of wreckage. Just visible from the lighthouse is a boy standing on the edge of the cliff top. He looks down at the waves bloated with life. Sea spume fizzes like sherbet, he thinks of his mother. He thinks of sherbet lemons. He remembers how she used to draw out the sugary powder before crunching the hard shell with her molars. The, the shards would score her gums, making them bleed, but like a chain smoker, she always went back for more. On her 40th birthday, he bought her dentures as a joke. He remembers how the smell, like citrus-scented bleach, always made him gag. That's how he feels now, like his stomach is all acid. The lighthouse keeper writes exceptionally clear in the weather log and shifts his focus to the cliffs. Using his telescope, he follows the serrated edge and settles on a, on a nest of tar-coloured razorbills. Their bodies are black, scored with white, like blood against snow. But it's the guillemots he's there for. He wants to see the young moors, wings extended like primitive parachutes, as they fling their bodies off the cliff face and land, alive or dead. But in searching for the guillemots, the lighthouse keeper finds something else. Behind the boy is a statue of St Andrew, it's where trawlers down on their luck go to pray for a better day tomorrow. He brushes his fingers along the ridges and curves, thinks of his mother, says a prayer. When the gulls pass overhead, he doesn't notice, because as salt air fills his lungs, he jumps. Later in the week, a police officer asks the lighthouse keeper if he saw any movement on the precipice. Was there any sign of life, he says, anything at all? Casting his mind back to that morning, the lighthouse keeper thinks of the white of the cliffs, the blue of the sky. He looks at his notes in the weather log and finds that at six minutes past six, he wrote exceptionally clear. He remembers the guillemots, and in that moment he cares only for the guillemots. So when he is asked for a third and final time if he saw anyone on that cliff edge, because any information could be vital at this stage in the investigation, the lighthouse keeper shakes his head and says, no, sir, not a soul. When he is finally left alone, the lighthouse keeper cracks his knuckles, takes a thimble of whiskey and makes a mental note to check the nest as if his life depends on it. Part one, autumn, two years later. Where there is water, there is life. And deep in the forest, along the river sticks, among bracken and bramble, among dead wood and fallen trunks, are tufts of common ink cap. A rare wrinkled peach grows on rotting elm, but nobody sees it buried there in the leaf litter. Willow herb produces its last flush of pink as acorns fall on sodden earth. I've always been afraid of the water, or to be more precise, the sea. It's something I've been taught to fear. Some people find that strange, for I'm the girl that lives on the edge of the island where land and sea meet. But I know that if I stray too far, it could pull me under. It doesn't take much to swallow a life. I've seen children be swept out too far on body boards, inflatable dinghies, rubber rings. Because like weather, it's mood swings. One moment it's calm and still, and the next it's charged and full of rage. Children return exhausted from the fight to stay alive. And so, to me, the sea remains wholly forbidden. Yet it's always there pulling me towards it. Visions of water leak into my dreams, and in those hours of somnolence, when all is quiet and still, I find myself in aquatic places, in kelp forests and dark crevices where new life breathes. In many ways, it's an extension of my home, 
but it's not my friend. The sea is strong enough to dissolve me. You know how old fruit that's thrown on the compost heap starts to break down? It'd be like that, an atrophying of sorts. So I make sure to keep my distance. There are times I've come close, through, a, through rippling a wave with the end of a stick or breaking the tide with a skimming pebble. But then Dee's voice gets into my head. There is much to be feared for the things we can't see. And that is enough to stop. There's another reason I can't go anywhere near it. I have a rare skin disorder. It's why I keep myself bandaged up and slathered in lotion. The lighthouse is where I eat, sleep, bathe, learn, cook. I can't go to school because it's far too risky. Children carry all sorts of things and my immune system can't handle all the mutating viruses that take on many perplexing forms. School is a death trap. The lighthouse keeps me safe.